today. I've really just had a marvelous time using scaffold because also it is such a way that I can give the information to the users. I have a core facility and a lot of collaborators. And what I want to talk about is uh, relative quantitative analysis or assessment of levels. And in this project, um, they were looking at electron transport chain components. Uh, complex one here uh, is very important for development of a proton pump. This complex is made up of at least 40 or 50 subunits in the mammalian protein and it is very subject to oxidative damage being in the mitochondrion. So this group wants to study different modifications, but you also have to way, have a way of assessing all of the components. We've done some MALDI and uh, various uh, LCMS analyses of these components. <coughs> Looking at a cryo-electron <coughs> micrograph of the complex, you see that there are what appears to be three lobes, which has presumed to be three subdomains of the protein. And in fact, some investigators have said that if you do anion exchange chromatography, you can separate these subdomains in this way, where there's supposed to be three. Now, uh, Patrizia had, this is supposed to be these three domains and then this extra um, shoulder. So the question was, what are the proteins in each of the three domains? The paper that she had initially taken the separation from used N-terminal sequencing for most of their identification. So they clearly were only looking at major components and some MALDI data. So what we did, instead of trying to do multidimensional chromatography, she collected the fractions. And we took each one and ran it on a very short 1D gel, two centimeter run, then cut that run into seven arbitrarily determined bands. We call them slices so that it doesn't indicate an actually stained band. Did LCMS on a, a linear ion trap LTQ uh, for each one, and then took the results from all of the slices from each peak and combined them in what Scaffold would call a mud pit style analysis. I would say it makes a single data set and looked on Scaffold. Now, obviously, you can't see these names, but what's immediately obvious is these are not unique peaks. Almost all of these subunit proteins show up in all of the fractions. So I wanted to get a sense from the data of how distinct were the peaks. Could we get any quantitative information about the components? We're going to pick one. I literally did pick this at random. I didn't want to pick the most abundant, and I didn't want to have to struggle with the least abundant. So I picked this, what's called 24 kV subunit, which actually is a predicted likelihood weight of 27. And this is the coverage map for this protein. So we had 55% coverage. Now remember, this is the combined results of seven LCMSMS runs. And when I would look at the number of identified spectra, I said, wait a minute, I couldn't have that many. I'm using dynamic exclusion. But it's multiple runs added together. And we're going to look at the results from this specific peptide. Again, I just picked out one that was in the middle of the abundance range. And what I wanted to do was see how would it give relative quantitative information based on a traditional approach, which would be integration of a selected ion retrieval peak. Now, this seemed a natural way to me. I first got into mass spectrometry, I hate to say it, in 1971, where we were doing single ion monitoring of acetylcholine in over Z58 fragment. And actually, uh, it got me a science paper, so it's probably my first and last of those. But, uh, so what I did is, with the selected ion retrieval, looked for the two plus ion of this peptide, plotted where does it elute, and then integrated each of these peaks. And what I'm showing here is the area value. So this is, could be confusing, peak one, the slices. Now, I automatically assumed uh, that slice one was at the bottom and slice one is at the top, maybe because I'm short. But Chris, who ran this, is 6'4", and slice one is actually at the top. So I'm sorry, it's, this is the highest molecular weight slice and the lowest molecular weight. So you can see this is the maximum of these slices, 5E5, 
Now here's peak two that had the most peptides in it, very high intensity, and you can see it shows up in several slices. Peak three, we're down a little bit in maximum intensity. Now peak four, that kind of surprised me as I was doing it because in the most intense slice, it was only present in four slices. I mean, it was the intense peak. And here we had it, all of them. Retention times match. We use a very good HPLC system. So I said, I better go back and validate the panda mass spectra for this peak to be sure that it's really correct. And in fact, when I looked at it, all of the others I've showed you were, but this was not the right peak. This one was. So I you know, called the guys in the lab. I said, what, you know, what's the deal here? Did we pack a new column? What happened? And it turned out there had been some injector issues, and we cleaned it out. And so retention time is a little different. The reason I want to point this out is if one is using only mass, not presumably high resolution, accurate mass would obviate this problem. But if you're not doing any validation of the tandem spectra, you could easily have the wrong peak. These are two ions of <coughs> nominally the same mass. So if you look at this table, I tried to compare different ways to look at the values. I summed the areas, and in this case it's all the validated peaks. And that's the sum of the areas. I took the area in the slice that had the most intense quantity, and then I took these values straight from scaffold, the number of total identified spectra, and this I, is that particular peptide. When you export the peptide report, you can get the number of incidences of that peptide. Now again, I saw this 35. I said, wait a minute, I'm using dynamic exclusion. But again, this is because it's a sum uh, of several runs. And you can see here that first off, while it should be obvious, it absolutely works. P2 is most intense. I normalized to P2. And the others, on an absolute scale, isn't quite exactly right, but I only took one ion and in this case, and then this is total spectra. But if you look back at the absolute areas, clearly the peaks are in a very good order. And so you could get very reasonable information about relative quantities by a very straightforward way without having to go to accurate mass data and without having to do anything very complicated. Now the student was thrilled because she's getting close to the end of her dissertation work. And so even though the subunits showed up in multiple places, she was able to group them by what was most abundant in each of these uh, subdomains. And it, she was very excited because it was very close to what was in the literature. Well, I was sitting in her presentation a few weeks ago and thinking about showing this to you. So I asked her some questions about, tell me exactly how you acquired the sample and what the volumes were and how much you put on the gels. And she showed me the HPLC trace, first that she deconvoluted it with a computer program into these sub-peaks to try and get a sense of the relative areas. And with the program, you can integrate the peak and surprisingly, peak 2 and peak 3 were pretty much the same. So I said, OK, so where did you make your cutoff for your fractions? And she said, well, that's what she did. I said, wait a minute. You didn't use the same quantity of each one? No. So she had four fractions here, two here, and for whatever reason, one there. So she put. Uh, supposedly the same amount of protein on each gel, but she figured the amount of protein based on A280. So we haven't quite figured out what she's going to do about it because from a real quantitative point of view, it's not correct. But the scaffold data is absolutely representative of the samples that she gave us. So it was very easy for us to quickly get information about the relative quantities. But whether there's biological relevance to it, can't say. Here's Texas blue bonnets in the summer. We also <laughs> have flowers. Thank you.